just to finish up so that they can come here. I'm going to go ahead and start. Good morning and welcome to the second day of the conference. Thank you for joining us and we promise you a dynamic panel discussing new market overseas, growing your business by exporting. My name is Hovan S. Dorian. I am with the Washington Department of Commerce, and our mission at the department is to support you, life science companies, and global health organizations by creating business networking opportunities to expand your international operations and export activities, which in turn will accelerate our economic growth in Washington State. Consider us, along with WBBA, as your partner of success. To achieve this goal, we organize trade missions, participate in trade shows, and be your advocate in identifying international expansion opportunities. Let me share with you what we have planned for the rest of the year. First, the governor will lead a trade mission delegation to India and Korea, a great expansion market that you should consider participating in. Second, Washington State will participate in Medica, which is the largest medical device meeting in Germany in November of this year. Join us. In December, we are organizing a trade visit to Saudi Arabia, and you should consider it. To help you with this endeavor, the Department of Commerce is offering qualified companies export vouchers to cover trade shows expenses up to $5,000. Those are against actual invoices. Visit us at our booth. We'll give you more details about those opportunities. Before I introduce you to the moderator, one housekeeping item. Please use the single page printed guide as the latest and most updated guide for, for the event. Lisa Cohen is the director of Washington Global Health Alliance, a coalition of states leading global health research and development organizations. WGHA supports and advances Washington State global health community as a nexus for research, education, training, and delivery in world stage. WGHA executive members include at Seattle Biomedical Research Institute, University of Washington, Fred Hutchinson Cancer Center, the Bill Gates, uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and many, many, many more. Lisa serves on several boards, including Global Health Nexus Seattle, Washington Global Health Fund, Global to Local, WBBA, and others. Lisa is a visionary leader, a compassionate and passionate person who understands the global health issues and new markets, and who is dedicated with keen ability to energize others to the cause. Please give a warm welcome to Lisa Cohen. Good morning. Um, thank you very much, Hovan. First of all, I would like to compliment all of you for being here at 7.30 in the morning on a gorgeous morning. So here's to you, right. Um, so, it's terrific. This is actually a great way to start the day. Um, and we have a wonderful panel, um, a very diverse panel here for, for discussion. And I do hope that this will be a discussion. They're each going to give um, an overview of their experience in working in emerging markets. But we're very fortunate to have people represented from um, uh, the supply chain side, from the device and technology side, um, from equipment side, and then from broader commerce and how, <clears throat> and how you can be helped. So you feel free to ask tough questions. Um, this is, there's amazing opportunity here, as we all know, right, in the emerging markets. And, um, and it's a win-win situation. We've got this tremendous amount of innovation that's developed. 
uh, not only in the United States, but um, in all of the countries represented here. And the question is, how do we get this? How do we think about getting these ideas, these whether it's a device, a technology, or a method of, of, of supply chain operation to the countries that need it most? And there's a wonderful um, uh, market opportunity assessment that we've put together, WGHA has put together with the Seattle Office of Economic Development that's available on our website that talks about getting into emerging markets. But we need help for the, these um, uh, uh, developing countries in every sense, from life sciences to agriculture to supply chain to um, uh, everything you can imagine in terms of um, uh, opportunities for, for moving forward. So um, I hope that you all will think about this with an open mind this morning. Um, while we all know that we need to do this and there's opportunity, the ways to get there, the road can be a little bit tricky at times. And so that's where I think we, we need to have the discussion around this to, this morning. I do want to highlight um, uh, something for all of your companies that we've put together with the Department of Commerce, the University of Washington, and WBBA. And that's a website called Life Science lifesciencestartup.com, and um, that's going to provide actually case studies for how to get your market, your, your product to market, what sorts of regulations, if you're trying to get a CE mark or anything, there are specific opportunities to think about that, resources to help you with funding, and it's a terrific website, so I hope that you'll consider that. You can find it on the WBBA website um, and then also at lifesciencestartup.com. You also can get more information on um, WA Exports, waexports.com, uh, through the Department of Commerce that can help you. And it doesn't matter whether your company is based here or uh, someplace else. I think it's useful information for anybody. So. Um, uh, we also, I'd also like to make sure and encourage you to uh, visit our booth, um, lifesciencestartup.com, at the break. And uh, Vajra Allen and Maren Oaks, who organized today's session, and I'd like to thank, um, will be there and can answer your questions as well. So, um, as I say, we've got a terrific panel, and um, uh, we'll, I'd like to, I'm just going to give everybody a quick introduction and then do more in-depth as we go through, um, introduce each of them as they uh, give their individual remarks. So um, Ken Maydell is VP of Sales and Marketing at Cascade Designs, a camping equipment company. And um, I'm going to let him explain what the heck he's doing up here talking about uh, technologies in emerging markets when we get to him. Uh, Trevor Gunn is a Senior Director of International Relations at Medtronic. Um, uh, and I know you're all familiar with Medtronic, the largest um, technology company, I believe, and uh, in one of the largest in the world at this point. So Trevor's got some great stories to tell. Um, and then we have um, uh, Tembi uh, Sechrist, who's from the U.S. Department uh, of Commerce. And uh, pardon me, I'm a little bit slow this morning, apparently, since it's 7.30, uh, so my apologies. Um, and then we have Mar uh, Mike Harkins, who's the Director of Marketing for U uh, UPS, um, and we'll talk about supply chain. So we're going to start with Ken this morning. Um, as I mentioned, he's with Cascade Designs, his camping equipment company based here in Seattle. Um, he's the senior executive responsible for global sales and marketing for the outdoor equipment business and setting the strategy for the company's future. They're doing some very interesting work thinking about how they can apply their technologies um, in emerging markets. Prior to joining Cascade Designs, uh, Ken was a management consultant for Ernst & Young um, and focused on supply chain and consumer packaged goods. And um, he holds a BS on computer and information science, so that's another interesting um, divergence from Ohio State University College of Engineering. So Ken Maydell, why don't you start off? Thank you, Lisa. Good morning. Um, I'll talk a little bit about uh, Cascade Designs and its history and how I ended up uh, sitting here in front of uh, this conference, which seems like a circuitous path. Cascade Designs, for those of you who don't know it, is a 40-year-old local company uh, based right here in Seattle. Uh, we make outdoor equipment, so if you've gone camping, you've probably used some of our products. We're Thermarest sleeping mats, MSR snowshoes, stoves, water filtration, uh, sea line dry bags, platypus hydration packs, things like that. And the company got its start uh, in 1972 with some laid-off Boeing engineers and one who uh, continued to work there, and they were looking for something to do, so they invented a self-inflating sleeping mat and really built the company off of that. Um, it turns out 
that a lot of the things that we work on from an engineering perspective lend themselves to solving a subset of problems that exist in, in uh, uh, the global health arena. So what we really know how to do, we're, we're primarily an engineering and manufacturing company. I know that's relatively rare these days, but uh, we have a couple hundred thousand square feet under roof uh, in the Soto neighborhood. And by dollar volume, we make about 80% of what we sell in North America right here in Seattle. We have another plant in Cork, Ireland that manufactures a subset of our products for Europe. And we export those products all over the world and, and have really from the beginning uh, of, of our company's history. So we're fairly seasoned in terms of exporting, but mostly to uh, markets that have a strong outdoor um, component, people that recreate outdoors. So because we know how to engineer things, and that's our company's history, we, what we really know how to do is to take fairly hard physics problems and make them into uh, useful devices in small footprints. And for 40 years, so 35 years or so, we mostly contained ourselves to doing that uh, for people that could afford them. But it turns out that a lot of what we knew, uh, if we could get the dollar right, the, the price right, we could use uh, in helping to solve things like clean water problems uh, or portable combustion problems. So these problems are pretty well understood in the global health community. And about five years ago, we started to think about was there a way that we could build a business around that? And one of the things that informed that was uh, we sent a couple of employees over to Sri Lanka after the 2004 tsunami to help assist with some of the recovery efforts there around clean water. And we used a device called the Myox Pen, which is a commercial device we helped develop with the U.S. Uh, Marine Corps, funding out of the old uh, appropriations method through Congress, what is now uh, uh, sort of verboten. Uh, we used an earmark process to get funding to help develop that. And that turned out to be able to generate a mixed oxidant bleach, basically, although it's a little more complicated than that, uh, on the fly. And we could do that in fairly small doses with this pen. And we started to think about other ways we could do that. Simultaneously, we had um, a group of these engineers who, in their spare time, were assisting all of these little efforts that were springing up all over Seattle for things like, how do you replace wooden cook stoves uh, in the developing world, which are you know, horribly polluting, very inefficient, they, they cause rapid deforestation. And if you could figure out a way to do portable combustion uh, in an easy, uh, small package, which we, we knew how to do, um, you can really make some, some things happen in the world. So there were all these things that kind of happened at the same time that led us to think, uh, you know, can we create a business out of this? And uh, what we've done since then is develop a device with um, some help from the Washington Global Health Alliance and uh, PATH and uh, some foundations, Lemelson Foundation and uh, Laird Norton Foundation, that does that mixed oxidant generation on the fly using a 12-volt battery, uh, salt, and water. And we've got a device now that's in a pilot that um, we can use in multiple models uh, in the developing world to generate fairly large amounts of clean water uh, with nothing but uh, those things I mentioned before, which are easily portable. And a 12-volt battery, this device will do uh, enough mixed oxidant solution to, to purify about 20 or about 200 liters of water, and the battery will do that about 200 times. And it also lends itself well to solar if, the, if you are in the point where you can't use a battery. Um, and uh, it turns out that those are the kinds of things we know how to do. Um, what we didn't know how to do so much was uh, distribute that out into these markets, and uh, uh, I'll save some of those for the Q&A, but um, that's the part we've learned with a lot of uh, help from partners. Um, but that is kind of the story of Cascade and how we ended up being here, and we think there's an interesting future um, in that arena. So thank you. Thanks. Um, and so I think it's interesting. We've, this is Cascade Design, a relatively small company. Uh, with an idea who has leveraged that to think about how it can be expanded and brought to scale in the developing world. And um, in using really a diverse type uh, set of um, funding um, efforts to get that forward. So Department of Defense, 
um, working in partnership with uh, organizations who have global health experience, in this case PATH, um, and the Washington Global Health Alliance. They have been incredibly creative about thinking about um, how they can use this in terms of the uh, in education and, um, and working with broadly across not only the um, you know, thinking about the traditional sources of USAID funding or, or something like that, but thinking about the defense funding and the earmarking process and the, the importance of advocacy in moving these um, sorts of products forward and having some champions and understand, educating policymakers about how important this is. So someone who knows a lot about that, and we'll take up to the next step, is Trevor Gunn. And Trevor is Senior Director of International Relations for Medtronic, which is based in Minneapolis. Um, it's the world's largest independent medical technology company. And um, Trevor was formerly the uh, longtime director of the, Depart of the Commerce Department's Business Information Service for newly independent States, the clearinghouse for the U.S. government information doing business in the former Soviet Union. So I bet you have a lot of stories to tell. Um, he also has served for the past 17 years as adjunct professor at, the, um, at Georgetown, and we're delighted to have him here today. So Trevor, if you can share a little background. Good morning to everyone. Thank you very much for Washington Global Health Alliances and the, 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 uh, the invitation to be here today. You know, when you think of global health, it's not many people around the world that think of Seattle as one of the uh, top centers for, for global health, but Medtronic recognizes that. That's why it's great to be here today. Um, and I think it's uh, really in the, in the first innings of its development, and, and we're very, very hopeful that we can continue to, to be a partner in, in so doing. Um, yeah, given my Russia days, I was frequently here in this fine city. It's one of the, the few cities in the country, I think, that really gives Russia a very, very fair hearing. Uh, in a balanced hearing, um, and, and uh, it, you know, it's great to be back. I'm myself from Northern California originally. So a few words on Medtronic, it, it, not, not because of marketing, but rather because of statistics. And so you can get a general sense of what we really are, because you're not going to find these statistics easily available to you. So we have actually in the market 71,000 medical technologies right now that are actually in production, uh, 64 manufacturing facilities, um, as our colleagues from Cascade Designs, you're actually, we're at, most people that look at our industry say they're actually quite shocked the fact that 75% of that manufacturing potential is still in the United States. Um, that's, a, that's a great story. Um, and, and one I'm very, very fond of telling my friends down the road at Boeing is they, they, they think that they are the poster child for a large supply chain. Fair to say? 20, 22,000 companies we're talking about in their supply chain. Medtronic is 72,000. 3.8 times as many as Boeing or Airbus does. Um, we may be making small devices, but, but supply chain issues, I'm sure our colleague from UPS will address those, absolutely critically important. And small, medium-sized business, the fact that we're a $17 billion revenue company, that's, that's really the key of what we do. And so whether you're a small company saying how Medtronic can be relevant to me, uh, I hope I'm, I'm trying to make the case to you that small, medium-sized companies, at least in the biomedical and that is the device space are absolutely at the cornerstone of the industry and we're key to see success of small and medium-sized companies uh, and, and to be a partner in that success. Medtronic internationally, um, I think we'll talk basically four points. Medtronic, Medtronic internationally, some of the challenges I think that we're experiencing as an industry globally and then some of the opportunities. That's what I'd like to go through just very quickly if you don't mind. I was given seven minutes, let's see if I can do it. Um, we actually have commercial sales in 130 countries in the world, um, but the fact of the matter is because most of our devices are implantable, probably 95% of them are implantable, you're talking uh, that our devices are actually found in every country in the world just because people actually move. So if they have a pacemaker, they move. Um, and though we may not have commercial sales in that country, the fact of the matter is we still have an obligation to the, that patient and to, to ensure that, that, uh, that the correct things are done. So understand, uh, very complex enterprise indeed. Um, we're represented by, in, in China alone, probably close to about a thousand partners, just to give you a sense of how complicated the business in one particular country can be. Um, but globally, we're talking several thousand distributors. And, and I would basically say we, like other companies, we kind of fall into th three sales models. One is direct, one is a hybrid model where we're basically, like in a, in a Russia, where we're basically backstopping with employees and doing um, education and training of new doctors um, with our devices. 
um, and in, in operating theaters, but at the same time, uh, you have the third model, which is obviously completely indirect, where we have nobody on the ground. So if you, we can come back to any of those questions. Our, our revenue mix international to international to domestic um, is still heavily weighted towards the domestic market, 55%. Um, and, and if you look at the international part, which is about 45 percent, still heavily weighted towards emerged markets with fairly developed infrastructure, with fairly well reimbursed, um, uh, very significant re uh, reimbursement systems. So not a lot of revenue activities per, per se. Numerically, in terms of the countries that we serve, we're heavily involved in emerging countries. But from a revenue perspective, that's becoming more and more important. Um, some of the industry challenges, and I want to talk less about Medtronic. Um, um, if you want to come back to that, that's fine. But um, I think our, our, our top global challenge, and, and I say that with some um, reservations because I know a, a lot of our colleagues are in the biopharmaceutical space here in the room, but it is our industry's confusion with the pharmaceutical industry. I don't know how people can actually confuse a, a pacemaker for, with, a, with a pill, but yet, in, in, I would tell you probably 70 percent numerically of the countries around the world, we have regulatory systems and reimbursement systems um, that we're struggling with because they simply don't know the technology is different. And I'd say, I'd say the fault is largely ourselves. We only have about seven or eight companies of any size um, in our, I mean, of significant global size in, in our industry. The vast majority are small, medium-sized companies, which is the greatest thing in the world. But the fact of the matter is, some of those companies aren't globally active or active through partners, and sometimes that message on kind of the, the, the distinct value in the technology um, doesn't get through. Meanwhile, I think everybody in the room also knows that some of the, the incredible advances that have come in medicine actually have to do with the collaborations between biopharmaceutical companies and medical device companies, the insulin pump, the drug eluting stent, the uh, baclofen pump for MS and CP. Well, again, we're making the technology piece. Others are making the pharmaceutical piece. But I do think that we, as an industry, um, are really, really struggling. And one of the big problems we have in a lot of emerging countries around the world, and, and I can cite one specific African country, been working on getting drug eluting stents into this country for three years, have not been able to get more than $10,000 into this country. I, I, it's it, incredible, because we're classified as a pharmaceutical. And, and, and they're struggling with that. So we have regulatory challenges, reimbursement challenges. Um, the, the fact of the matter is you obviously know that when you're talking about advanced technology as opposed to technology uh, well, or, or pharmaceuticals, you, you have a lot of issues on just being able to get paid. And that's something that you need to be uh, acutely aware of, particularly if you're a small company, up, starting up and, and, and making sure that you have a clear path. Uh, obviously, I've made the, the point on, on regulatory. Uh, a country like India. Uh, today actually classifies the medical device industry as a pharmaceutical industry. Um, that is discomforting to us, and, and though there is 100 percent agreement within the Indian government that we need to have a separate uh, road forward for our industry, the fact of the matter is we're still being classified as a pharmaceutical industry, and because uh, India may have um, similar issues that Washington has right now, that issue is just simply not being pushed forward because of issues of momentum. But we're keen to, to, to have that better understood. Opportunities, let's focus on that as the final point. I mean, the medical device sector and the pharmaceutical sector are together uh, one of the top five sectors under the National Export Initiative. That is the, the President's signature initiative. Let's use it, guys and gals. Let's use it and let's, let's ensure that our politicians um, understand that, you know, when we have 75 percent of our capacity just as a company, or you have 100 percent of your capacity here in the United States, we need to be known. And I think the greatest part of this whole industry is not the fact that it's a political initiative, but the fact that as I, you know, in traveling all around the world, I have responsibility in 130 countries, all of those countries. You know, in the medical device sector, people are still looking back to the United States for the next important thing. Always looking back to the United States for the next important thing. It's not, they're not looking to China for the next most important thing. Now, China will come, and it's coming on strong, but that's not the case today. Let's use that. Let's also capitalize on the fact that it is a small, medium-sized, dominated industry, but we need to band together to make the mass, to have a real voice. In the pharmaceutical industry, you're talking 29 large companies, okay? We need to be able to use our alliances with major organizations to develop a voice that is distinct and collaborative with all areas of the, of the life sciences. And I think that will help, uh, uh, but, but we need to do it better. Uh, and we need to be a partner in that. Um, 
I think the, the, the move to tertiary healthcare globally is something. You could say it's because of medical tourism or whatever it is. I know you've got, even got an alliance here. I've met with the Seattle Convention Bureau, et cetera, even on these type of issues. Whatever the issues are behind the, the growth in tertiary healthcare, particularly in emerging countries, it gives incentives for doctors to stay in their countries. I think that everyone, frankly, wants for development purposes. At the same time, it gives um, gives rise to new and interesting innovations that people have never thought because if you don't have advanced clinical settings, you're simply not going to get the innovation that you might have otherwise got. Um, and factually, it, it gives service to, to people and families that have never, never even known that, uh, that a technology existed or, or, or a pharmaceutical substance existed for their, for their purposes. So it's a fantastic opportunity for us going forward. Non-communicable diseases. Now, you can talk uh, a, a lot about um, uh, global health funding, but today, given all the donors in the world, there's only one to three percent of donor funding, USAID, World Bank, all the major agencies focused in the emerging countries on non-communicable diseases. We were partnered in bringing together the high-level meeting um, at the United Nations, which was only the second time that at the level of the UN General Secretary, health had actually been formally discussed. The first time was ten years ago in HIV AIDS. And that's very, very important for all of us, particularly if you have technologies that address cardiovascular disease, diabetes, cancer, respiratory, frankly, anything that's non-infectious. Very, very important. Now, finally, governments around the world are waking up to the fact of what actually kills their people. Rather than simply where governments want funding to be available, they're actually looking much more broadly, and that's very important to get the epidemiology right. Aging, no, no, no one is going to be able to do anything about that. Let's try to manage the costs. We're very keen to get people out of hospitals as hum quickly as humanly possible. Um, and, uh, you know, that's going to be a big, uh, a big, big issue. And, and I think that technologies that enable that to happen, uh, many of the ones that are here, health information technology, and a lot of the technologies that we produce are specifically designed to get people quicker procedures, less expensive procedures, back home to their families, their workplaces, wherever they wanted to be, and, but not in the hospital. And hospitals are great. But let's limit the purpose and let's move on. Um, and then, of course, uh, you know, let's, a great opportunity for us is our private public partnerships more broadly. Um, Tembi um, and I were on a trade mission to India. By the way, there were 17 companies by, by about $16.5 billion. I was the largest company on that mission, very successful to India. You guys ought to be hooking up with them at the hip. Um, and our colleagues at Washington State Government. You think that they only respond to companies like us, you're lying to yourselves. They actually, the core of this industry is small, medium-sized companies. They are as responsive to small, medium-sized companies as they are to large uh, organizations such as ourselves. And I strongly suggest you use the assets that you have um, rather than focus on, on, on those that are in, in the part of the glass that's half, uh, half empty. Thank you. Thanks, Trevor. Um, okay, a lot of food for thought on that. Um, I do want to, on, on Trevor's last point, the governor is going to be doing a trade mission uh, this fall to India and Korea, and, um, and we'll, there'll be a lot of focus on um, technologies. I know Chris Rivera is going to go on that trip. I may be on that trip, and um, you may want to consider having your company go along as well. Um, also, to the point about what's coming forward, I do want to mention that the um, Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation here out of Seattle, it's affiliated with the University of Washington, is coming out in this fall with the new Global Burden of Disease metrics. And um, that's going to be the first time in 11 years that that's been done. I've seen previews of what's going to be coming out, and as Trevor talked about, it is going to be a lot on respiratory issues, cardiovascular, diabetes, you know, obesity, these sorts of issues, those non-communicable diseases have a huge, huge impact, and it's something you should be thinking about as you're going forward. Also, in terms of the technologies being developed, as you think about it, if you're looking at emerging markets, think about your price point when you start your development. Um, think about how it's going to be uh, addressed culturally in, the, in these emerging markets, whether it's going to be taken up. We can all have these fabulous ideas, and, um, and yet if people aren't going to use the product for whatever reason, then that's going to be useless. So one of the things that we talk about a lot in our um, in our sector is uh, the issue of the tech pileup, and we're worried about all these fabulous 
uh, new technologies, whether it be pharmaceuticals or devices and diagnostics, um, but how are they going to be uh, um, actually adopted in the emerging markets? So um, that takes us to Mike um, uh, Harkins, who's here from UPS, and when we think about that, we talk about the last mile in global health. How do we get these technologies out there and the supply chain issues? So I'm going to ask Mike to uh, talk about how UPS is helping in that supply chain. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you for, to the WBBA for inviting us. Just a quick word about UPS. We're this year going into our 105th year of existence. We started right here in Seattle, and uh, we're glad to be part of this event. When we take a look at what's hindering the factors that are hindering life science organizations from participating in global, the global markets, we see two primary challenges. And the first one, and Trevor just spent a lot of time on it, is gaining regulatory approval to, to import or export your products into a specific country. Now, we all know that the U.S. for life science products is, is heavily regulated, and it is in international countries and foreign countries as well. However, these organizations already have good people and processes in place that help them navigate through the regulatory environments within the U.S. Those same people and processes can be used to navigate international regula regulations and, you know, whether or not you can change the minds of specific countries like India, maybe not, but at least you've got the expertise and the, um, the people and processes in place to be able to take that on. Secondly, though, the second challenge is the development and management of a global supply chain. <clears throat> the movement of goods and information are integral in the foundation of developing a global supply chain. You've got to have both. And this is typically not a core competency, especially for the small and emerging life science organizations. Many large healthcare companies, such as Medtronics, have, have found it the most efficient, timely, and effective means of uh, establishing global supply chains is to work with a logistics integrator. Now, these logistics integrators can provide turnkey solutions that help you manage material and information flows all from supplier all the way to end, end customer and or patient in this case. Uh, when evaluating a logistics integrators, there's a number of attributes that you want to take a look at. Uh, first, foremost, is an international global uh, transportation and distribution infrastructure. Secondly, would be an IT or, or technology portfolio that is healthcare compliant tested and validated. Consult, consultative expertise in the areas of uh, healthcare compliance and, and setting up uh, global networks is also a, an attribute you should look at. Uh, visibility, global visibility, is it a well-known company? Um, do they have healthcare specific transportation and storage solutions? Do they have good security systems? And do they have regulatory and, and trade compliant uh, expertise that can help make sure you get your product through customs uh, as quickly as possible. Do they have a demonstrated sus and sustained investment, long-term investment in uh, healthcare expertise and capabilities? Uh, can they quickly adapt to changing market conditions through multimodal or multi-channel solutions? And do they provide public affairs support? You know, Trevor talked to, touched a little bit on that. Um, does your these, the company you're evaluating, the logistics integrator that you're evaluating, have a public affairs uh, infrastructure set up within the country that you want to go to. Uh, many of the large ones do and can help you get medical devices changed from pharmaceuticals to medical devices. Uh, at least, you know, they'll be right there with you uh, as a partner helping you to, to make those changes. And lastly, do they have quantified examples, case examples, where they can demonstrate that they've uh, implemented a strategic supply chain solution with a specific client? So when you take a look at those factors, they can help you evaluate whether or not a specific logistics integrator can meet the needs of your supply chain, especially to the countries that, that you're trying to, to export to. Thank you. So as Mike mentioned, um, partnership is absolutely key. And um, and if you think about that in the in uh, emerging markets, that um, uh, we need to 
you don't have to reinvent the wheel, right? You don't have to start from scratch. There are a lot of services and partners available. At the Washington Global Health Alliance, um, we, we surveyed a bunch of uh, the, the major global health organizations, public and private, here in the state, and um, found out that these 50 out of 59 organizations that we surveyed, they're working in 156 countries. And so partner with people who are already have something going on as best as you can, who have expertise, who can help you get through with the, su the supply chain issues, talk to UPS, talk to Medtronics, talk to others. Um, it's a very collaborative, generally a collaborative field. People are happy to provide assistance. And then if you participate um, in some of these missions and, and uh, uh, trade opportunities, then it's going to help you learn as you go. So one of the key resources for that um, is the U.S. Department of Commerce to help you navigate this. And Tembi Seacrest is the Senior International Trade Specialist. Um, and with the U.S. Commercial Service, the Export Promotion Agency of the U.S. Department of Commerce. Um, she works with companies in life sciences, biotech, uh, I think everybody here knows her, and may, probably many of you do as well. Um, and she's your go-to person for resources. So, Tembi, if you would come up and just give us a sense of some of the services offered, and actually you can stay there and do that, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely, thank you. Um, well, at, at the basic level, people have been figuring out international trade for thousands of years, right? Any port city or major city was founded on a trade route. so. In one sense, it's not any more complicated than doing business in the United States. You find someone who wants your product, and between the two of you, you figure out there's a chance to make money, so you make it work. Um, but at the other hand, there's, there's a lot of complications that come in, especially in the medical device and life science sector, where any, any foreign government wants to know what products are coming in, how it's going to affect their people, and if there is some sort of an adverse reaction, who they can blame for that. So it does get a little bit more complicated in um, regulatory issues issues in transportation issues and uh, fortunately in this area we have a plethora of resources available and so quickly in, in five to seven minutes I'm going to try to cover some of those and usually I can cover about an hour's worth of information in five minutes but I'm only one cup into my personality so we'll see how much I can get <laughs> through this morning. Um, at the first level, you, you all heard from Hovan who introduced us. He's with the Washington State Department of Commerce. And um, they have some terrific resources, particularly in matchmaking. And the great thing about their services is that they are what I like to call prepaid, so free of charge for you, clearly um, tax dollar supported, but you've already paid for it, so might as well use it. They have representatives in, I believe, 17 countries now through um, some consulting agreements there, and it's a great way just to see what you can find, um, in addition to many of their programs with the, um, trade missions with the governor and um, some other uh, funding programs that Hovan mentioned that are available now. So um, it, it's a great opportunity to take advantage. Hovan and I are on the same floor. We're both called the Department of Commerce. People confuse us easily. Um, Hovan's predecessor, many of you know, is June Chino. So between June and September at the Department of Commerce, we're just used to you know flipping emails back and forth and figuring out who the best person is to do that. Um, what Trevor mentioned earlier, which I think is a critical point, is how do you get paid? So all this you know, international trade and global health is great fun in games, skittles and ponies, but if you're not getting paid, it's not very much fun at the end of the game. Um, Washington State also has a great partnership with the Export Finance Assistance Center of Washington, and that is a nonprofit entity that was actually created by the state legislature. Um, it's all their consulting services are, are free of charge, prepaid, um, and they are there to help you figure out how to put together those deals, how to um, find credit insurance that's appropriate for your products, how to work through Exim Bank, um, insure against adverse risk, insure against um, payment loss, and a, a myriad of, of other options out there to make sure that you have the flexibility to provide terms to your buyers if that's what's needed. Um, to make sales into markets that may or may not be um, the most stable at that current time that you can take some of those deals that you would not have considered otherwise with, with some insurance options there. Um, so they are also located in uh, the, the Washington State Department of Commerce's office and really worthwhile just sitting down and talking to them. Um, they're, they're truly experts in some of those financing deals. Um, and then my organization is the U.S. Department of Commerce, we're the, we're the federal side of things, and we have representation in 
in um, every embassy and consulate around the world. So we cover, um, we organize our, our efforts into four major areas. The first one being market research. So finding the information that you need before you go into a country so that you kind of have an idea of what you're getting into, what the market potential is, um, you know, how much money you should be making, what the best intro channels would be. A lot of that information is found on our website. If you don't take anything else away from this, please remember export.gov. Um, it is the, the general portal for all of, of our federal government trade resources that are available there. Again, that's export.gov. And um, through there, again, a lot of market research statistics, um, a lot of basic information on you know, pricing, logistics, some of those other things that it's good to think about before you get your, stuck, your stuff stuck in customs. <laughs> like, what do I do now? Um, so we have market research. Um, kind of our, our bread and butter is our, our matchmaking services as well. Um, as I mentioned, the, the um, state has some of those. Ours are um, available for a, a fee-based service. And kind of how we structure our fees is anything that is only um, specific towards your one particular company, we do have a cost recovery fee charge. We do offer a money back guarantee though, you don't get that from the IRS, so I think we're one up on that one. Um, and anything that, that would benefit an entire industry, we do provide us as just part of a government service. But our matchmaking services are available anywhere in the world. Um, which is particularly great when countries where, you know, it might be more difficult to find from um, conventional channels. Um, in addition to that, we can do in-depth background research on a particular company. So you've all gotten those emails that you are related to some deceased general in the middle of nowhere and um, have a lot of money awaiting you. They just need a little bit of information. And some of you may have gotten some similar emails on the business side that you're not sure if they're legitimate or not. Um, and sometimes they can be, you know, just because it's a Yahoo or a Hotmail address in, in a foreign country doesn't necessarily mean that they are not a legitimate company. Um, but that's something that we can take a look at, make some phone calls in country and um, help you find out whether or not it's something worth pursuing. Um, we also provide a lot of support in trade missions and trade shows. We organize uh, some very large programs at, at Medica, the largest medical trade show in the world, um, and at various other trade shows. Those are all listed again on export.gov, where we will bring in buyer delegations. Um, next week I'm on my way to LA to go to the uh, American Association of Clinical Chemistry Conference. We have 10 delegations um, with at least 15 buyers coming in from around the world so great way just to you know be, be matched up with some folks that are coming through that are interested in your your goods and services um, and the best part being we would promote that ahead of time so you know who you're meeting with and have some of those expectations set and then the final area that um, we really focus on is the advocacy and consulting um, the, on the consulting side you know I am happy to sit down with you at any point take a look at what your products are what your potential markets are um, you know maybe pick out a topic Top five that would be great for you to look at and uh, help you plan a path to get there. Um, on the advocacy side, that covers anything from regulatory issues, like Trevor mentioned, you know, when you have foreign governments that maybe aren't classifying your product appropriately, we're happy to work with you and with the foreign government to see how we can lower those barriers and make that country accessible to your products. If there's a foreign tender coming out, we can advocate on your behalf, which is particularly relevant in, in the healthcare sector with so many um, healthcare systems run through foreign governments. Those tenders often come through. Um, we can't play favorites, so if there's more than one U.S. company going for the tender, we'll just say, American, um, but if you are the only U.S. company bidding on that tender, we will advocate specifically for your company. So a lot of resources available, and um, you know, I know there's not a lot of time, but please do find me afterwards, and I'd be happy to talk with you and see how we can um, do whatever we can to make you successful internationally. Wow, that was <laughs> amazing. <laughs> um, so I think actually, Tembi, will you be available in the booth afterward in the Life Sciences Startup? Yeah. Okay, good, because, whoa, we were writing really fast over here. And um, um, so listen, I want to invite you all to come up for questions. We've got about um, a little less than 15 minutes left in the, in the session. And I know it's hard to ask the first question, so I'm going to offer a WBBA pen to the f person who wants to come up and ask the first question. I'm betting Monty Montoya is going to make a beeline for the um, microphone. Oh, excellent. OK, good. Because I can sit here and ask questions all day, but I think it's more important that you do. So who's our first winner today? All right, I'm Ted Weiler. I'm with the University of Washington Center for Commercialization. 
And I also have an outside interest in development of appropriate technology for third world countries. And I wanted to key off something Ken said, but first I want to thank the panel for getting up and speaking coherently at this early hour as well. That's uh, really appreciated. Um, one of the things I've run into both a little bit at C4C, but mostly in my outside interest in appropriate technology, in conversations with PATH and bioengineering programs at UW, uh, Rice, Duke, Columbia, wherever, uh, there seems to be no shortage of ideas for appropriate medical devices that would work in sub-Saharan Africa or India or, or wherever. And these programs will develop these products and they'll get them to a prototype stage and their pet doctor will take them to Ghana or Mali or wherever. And everybody will love it and then that's the end. Mm -hmm. There is no opportunity for specifically in-country manufacturing distribution and support. And this seems to be a common problem that a lot of these programs run into and it's difficult to, to set up one where you're going to make money, as you were saying. That tends to be the, the bottom line, so they're Grameen-like approaches to this. But I wonder if you could comment on, on potential strategies for if you've got a new cook stove, finding a way to actually get that in country so it's manufactured in improving education level and, and economies in, uh, in the target areas. Thank you. That's a great question. We're, uh, we're right in the middle of it now. And um, I'll give you a couple of uh, thoughts and then our experiences. So the first thing that we found is um, you have to partner well. And uh, what's true for us in our outdoor business is proving to be very true for us in our emerging markets business, which is th the key really is to know the customer and to know their landscape. And we are um, wholly incapable alone of figuring that out in places like Kenya or Ghana. Uh, and so we have to work with people who do know that. Um, and those are people for us like PATH, like the US Department of Commerce, folks like that. Um, the, the, the answer to your question, though, your question was a little bit different than that. Uh, and so really what we did first was to learn a lot about the background and learn about the landscape. And what we found is exactly what you pointed out, which is in many of these places where we think our technology can be applied, even if we can hit cost targets, uh, how do you ever get out of the prototype stage and the pilot stage? Um, there's actually another part of that that you didn't mention, which we're finding now. Um, which is that uh, there are these competing technologies and, and there's this um, problem of funding. How do you fund through what we call the valley of death? And so it's pretty easy for us to, uh, as a commercial organization, I mean, we're, we're pretty unrepentant capitalists. We wouldn't do this if we didn't think that we could make money at it. We're very good at commercializing things, but there's this long phase where um, we have to make a lot of investment before we see a return. And so you have two problems. One is the funding problem, one is the distribution problem on the ground. And what we found is we just have to know the customer and understand it, and our solution really becomes a much more holistic solution than just here's our product, here's how to market it, here's how to sell it. Uh, we have to look at multiple channels, and, and really I guess the, the final point is that the, the key to breaking through that, we think, is probably education and support once we get in market. And so it's not as simple as just finding the right distributor, finding the right contact, finding the right partner. You actually have to own the ecosystem once these things are in country. Um, and then what we found is that when you can do that, the people that are using this, um, and depending on which distribution model we're talking about, but, but in this case, the kiosk model is just the one I'll use as an example. Um, these people are very smart. Uh, they don't have much money. And I think what we've learned is it's a, it's a really a mistake to assume that that's the same thing as they don't understand what's going on around them. They absolutely do. And if you come in and say, no, you should do this, uh, that is where a lot of these things wither on the vine. You have to listen to them as the customer and learn from the way it works for them and then help them evolve to wherever it is that you think jointly you should go. And that seems to be working. Uh, I'll let you know in a year <laughs> uh, when we're out of the pilot stage, but uh, so far so good. We're, we're an advanced pilot and um, sometimes the hard part is commercialization. We know that part uh, and uh, we're working on the part that you mentioned, but it's a great question. Thank you. 
Uh, I'll share one quick anecdote also about that. You know, thinking about everything um, involved, and if, if you're creating, for example, a device, you have to think about um, absolutely every part of the packaging of everything to make sure that it's culturally appropriate to wherever you want to sell it. And um, for instance, PATH developed a, um, a diaphragm for women, a one-size-fits-almost-all diaphragm, and it took a year to come up with the color um, that was not going to you know, be culturally um, offensive in some ways for a broad market. And so that's just, it's to that level of detail that you need to think about um, how this is going to be adopted. So did anybody else want to comment on, on that? I'll just, Trevor? I'll just put Medtronic on the record. Um, with saying that we're very interested in talking to those type of companies. And, would, and then, you know, so our CEO, Bangladeshi, uh, Omari Shrak, used to be number two guy at GE Healthcare, very, very interested. Uh, really, on his watch, the V-Scan device that you see in GE commercials was created bringing down um, ultrasound from a $90,000 device down to something like $9,000 and not necessarily connected to the wall, if you get my point. And, and I can tell you that we're on fire within our own organization and trying to talk to, to organizations that in our particular sphere have those type of innovations. And connecting with companies such as ourselves that you may not have talked to before is something that we'd like to ensure that the door is open. I can tell you in the past three years, and I'm obsessed by this question, three years, I've not heard from one company in the classification that you would say to. So they're not approaching us, I think is the, 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 way, the right way to say it. And we'd like to make sure that you realize that we can't always guarantee the right answer or the answer that you want, but that, that the door is open. That's great. Monty. So Monty Montoya with Sight Life, where we're working to eliminate corneal blindness worldwide. Uh, first of all, I just want to provide an endorsement. And uh, uh, to those of you that represent small companies that are trying to figure out how to get into these markets, what September said is absolutely true. And uh, over 10 years ago, uh, our organization was just sort of getting into this area. Uh, then as the Northwest Lions Foundation, uh, Sight Life worked with September and her people. Since then, we have generated millions and millions of dollars in revenue from export of corneal tissue for transplantation around the world and really built on the expertise that we gained in working with September and, and her team. So uh, this does work, and so I, I just an uh, endorsement for, for what her team can do. Um, second, a question for Trevor. Um, you mentioned that, uh, just briefly, uh, not everybody realizes where Seattle is in the world of global health and, and biotechnology. And so, from your perspective, from uh, in Medtronic and also being back in, in Capitol Hill a lot of the time and in the, in the D.C. area, what are the things that we, uh, in the Pacific Northwest, and when I say that, I include Portland as well, uh, what are the things that we can do to raise the profile of what's going on here in the areas of global health and, and biotechnology? That's a great question, and I don't know if I have a magic answer, magical answer. Um, but I think the <laughs> so the great thing is that you have modesty here. That's a great quality. Okay, and I and I you know. Um, I'm from, you know, the Marin County originally, and I appreciate that also. And, and I come from a company that's from Minnesota, where they always accomplish a lot more than they ever speak about. Mm -hmm. So I understand that as it is. But I think that you have to be, I think that you have to be substantive. I think you have to be evidence-based. But I think you, I, I think the volume needs to be turned up slightly. Okay. And I, and I, you know, say that so that we're also culturally compliant, right? <laughs> and, and, you know, but, but I think you've got a great thing going here, and I can't speak more loudly, and, and that's why I said to Lisa, I'm, I'm going to be back in a few weeks. We want to be back here. Physio Control, by the way, used to be our company for 15 years um, and is no longer a part of the Medtronic family, but, um, I, you know, think of us as a partner trying to interpret that, but I think banding together, you, you have some of uh, the most unique global funding players sitting around. Um, PATH, which we're partnered with, um, you have WGHA, you've got people, you've got things going on given the Gates Foundation that frankly are, if they're going on elsewhere in the world, they're just not scaled. I, I, I just, I, I'm not giving you a good answer, um, but I am saying that you have the building blocks that should be much more successful and much broader known than, than, than they are right now. 
I don't want to come out to Seattle and just find all these things here. I want to be drawn in, in, as a magnet into Seattle, which I'm not. Okay, mm -hmm. but if I didn't do my research, I wouldn't have been drawn to that. I, I really appreciate. I, I, please, I hope you don't take no, it as I, I a disrespectful think, comment. I, no, I think it's a fantastic comment. And uh, several months ago, I was with a group of, of business leaders from Seattle in Edinburgh, uh, Scotland, and you know where really much of the modern world was invented, from banking to education, and on and on and on. And, and what we realized there is that Seattle really is in the process, and the Northwest is in the process of reinventing the world. And so you look at Boeing, you look at Microsoft, you look at Amazon, you look at Starbucks. Um, these are companies that are based here, and then you throw in what's going on in global health, and uh, there is a lot that's going on here that will emanate out into the future, and I, I agree with you that we don't do enough to, uh, to talk about that and laud that to, to draw more critical mass to what's happening. So thank you. That's a great so, comment. It, yeah, it's great. If I could just add to that, our, our experience is, um, as a smaller company, we're about 500 employees worldwide. Because we have a business providing um, camping equipment to the U.S. military, which we, we think of as the world's most dangerous campers, uh, <laughs> we, we uh, have a, a fairly good um, experience record dealing with um, Washington, D.C. And what I would encourage you to do to raise the profile is two things. One is to, is to do that, to go to Washington, D.C., even if you can't afford lobbyists and the things that you um, – see on the news is to just go there and meet with your elected representatives and tell them your story. Uh, it, it's, it's really amazing. The first time that I went, uh, you're sort of a, a little bit taken aback at, at how much attention you'll get. I thought, well, we're little tiny cascade designs. And people in DC, you know, typically their last outdoor experiences, it rained on them when they were waiting in line for movie tickets. And we just didn't think that we'd get much attention. And, 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 you know, boy, I was really wrong about that. I mean, it's pretty easy to kind of get an audience there. Second thing I would urge you to do is um, nobody knows what global health is as an industry. Nobody really understands what the difference is between that and life sciences. And, you know, I think uh, Trevor made a great point. So they just sort of lump it in. Um, and to the extent that you can help define it and make sure people understand that this is an emerging industry sector. It's not really well understood, but there's enormous potential. Seattle's at the center of it, and there are competitors. Uh, there are universities in Asia and Europe. There are governmental associations around the world who are going to work on these problems with a profit motive. Uh, that gets people's attention. There's jobs associated with this. This is an emerging economy, um, and Seattle is one of the hubs. Pacific Northwest is one of the hubs. That gets people's attention, and I would I would get used to and comfortable with telling that story to your elected officials. They they will listen to you. And also, real quickly, if I can just add in, and thank you, Monty, for those kind words. Good to see you. Um, the importance of showing up in foreign countries as you know the, the Northwest, going on these trade missions, telling your story overseas, and making sure that when people think of Seattle, they think of what you do. Um, you know, clearly we have we have the Microsoft Association, we have the tech, um, but there is a lot going on in in the global health and the medical device sector. Um, but it takes showing up. It takes participating in some of these international missions. It may not be a, an immediate um, connection for sales, but it's an investment that when people think, I have a need, I'm going to go to the Northwest and see what solutions are out there that will pay off in the long term. That's great. And it is, I think, something that Ken said, if you talk with policymakers, I mean, whether you're in the United States or uh, Mexico or Brazil, you know, if you're trying to get funding uh, to help, if you talk about the jobs you're creating, I mean, think about what is important to them, uh, to your audience all the time. So if you could talk about that. I know that uh, WBBA provides a tremendous amount of resources for organizations um, thinking, wanting to go forward. So, you know, call on them. I want to encourage you again to look at the lifesciencestartup.com um, website where you'll find a, a bunch of information and then the booth um, in the exhibit hall um, the panelists have said that they'll be happy to answer questions over there as well. And um, uh, as actually as a mother of a son in the Special Forces, I can tell you they are really dangerous campers. Um, it's, it's, it can be uh, quite remarkable. Also, I want to close with a quick plug for this is Global Health Month. 
um, at the Seattle Center. Chris talked about this in his opening remarks yesterday, that um, part of the reason that uh, Life Sciences Innovation Northwest is happening this month is to tie in, because there's so much overlap with global health and, um, and, and biotech and bio, um, uh, biomedical uh, and life sciences. So, so we want to thank WBBA for um, moving the conference to this month to highlight our common areas. And then we have exhibits going on at the Seattle Center. And then this weekend, for any of you who are staying, uh, we have an event with Melinda Gates that's free at Seattle Center called Groundswell on Saturday night. Um, we'll have a few thousand people there, and she'll be talking about, um, we'll have her and Chris Murray, the head of the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation, Craig Rubens from the Global Alliance Prevent Prematurity and Stillbirth from Seattle Children's, and they'll be talking about um, a lot of the issues that we're talking about today, about the importance of breaching into these emerging markets and how we think about doing that. So I'd like to invite you to come to that.